We're going to think about the goodness of God and uh, how He's truly filled our cup over the last 16 years. We praise God for that. Many of us have been saved longer than that, and before this place, God brought you, He's filled your cup other places. He's been good to us all the way through. Even in our lost condition, the Bible says the goodness of God brought us unto repentance. It's pretty amazing. We praise the Lord for that. I want to be so glad to see Pat Head here. We prayed special for her Wednesday night. I saw her in the hospital on Thursday, and she's here this morning. I'm so glad. Been in the hospital several days this week, and uh, God bless you. Good to see you. And uh, appreciate all these serving Super Church and the four and five year old church and nursery this morning. And uh, you hear them sometimes out through the wall, but I'm glad we have that. We don't hear them all in here, right? And we praise God, people serving in ministry. Thank the Lord for that. Psalm 65, if you're there, you found your place. We're going to read the psalm in just a minute. But I want to think about 17 years ago, Tuesday will be the 9 11 that we come to know it as. It was a wake up call for our nation. Um, maybe for the first time for some of us, we kind of felt like before that time that we were like the Titanic, a little bit untouchable. Uh, as they said, it was unsinkable. Even God couldn't sink. But we realized we were more vulnerable than we ever imagined for many of us, at least it was for me, in our own nation. And uh, what we dealt with after that, and we saw quite a response of people seeking the Lord after that. She sang about the woman at the well seeking. People went to church. There was all kinds of responses. Churches had more people in them after 9-11. People were praying all over the nation. There was all kinds of responses that day. Some responded as heroes, great acts of valor. Others, there was acts of hate and uh, terror. For a time, people prayed. People realized we need God's blessing hand on our nation again. God's goodness. 16 years ago, almost a year after that date, on September 8, 2002, Gospel Light Baptist Church began, had its first service. And uh, some of you were there for that. And they didn't meet in this property, of course. It's over there right beside Susan Shine on uh, 31 in that uh, little building there. It was right near Moon Motors at that time. But uh, anyhow, God's blessed over the last 16 years. We've seen the Lord work. And uh, as this church has honored the Lord in its stand on the Word of God, uh, we've honored the Lord in, our, in the work, His work, His Word as we've soul wind as we've sent missionaries around the world and, and are continuing to support missions like we have. And truly, God has given us here a family of friends. That's our church model, a family of friends. It's such a blessing and um, to love one another and to care for one another. And I know some have said, well, in 16 years we've seen God's goodness, and we have great things God's done. And we've, we've seen God do great things. I love, though, how the scriptures tell us, us that God, our God, is a God of greater things. And he has never uh, done the greatest thing, and it's all diminished from there. The Bible teaches that it shines brighter and brighter. Our God is a God that's advancing, doing greater things. Jesus would turn to his disciples and say, when I'm gone, you'll do greater works than I have done. Isn't that amazing? Our God's a God of greater things. And when God finds you, and when he saved you, if you know Christ as your Savior here today, he found you on purpose. Hallelujah, he has a purpose for you. And that purpose doesn't end until you take your last breath. He wants to use your life. He loves you. I love what D.L. Moody said, If God be your partner, make your plans large. If God be your partner, make your plans large. God wants to use you greater than most of us ever even thought about. God does not want to do just some little something with this church or with my life or with your life. God wants to do a lot of something with our lives. And the Bible says, exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think by the power that worketh in us. God wants to work and change us more like Christ. And the truth is we can stand here and talk the rest of the time we have this morning about God's goodness to Gospel by Baptist Church specifically and the miracles God has done. But let me just relay one thing, if you would, the miracle of how God, miracle of how God gave us this property here and what we have. 
uh, Gospel Baptist Church, before I was here, was meeting in a rented building over there on 31, as I mentioned. And uh, they were just still a small group, 60, 70, somewhere like that. And didn't have necessarily a ton of money in the bank. They had some. But to go to a bank and say, we want to borrow a large sum of money. We own six acres here. They looked at the property that's on the pipeline, Caddy Corner, across the road here. And they wanted 125000 an acre. That was back 11 years ago. And I had the pipeline running through it. And... This property here, that's a better property, was owned by a gentleman, and they were able to speak to them, and he was willing to give Gospel Baptist Church two acres of the six here. At, at, with, uh, he received a tax donation receipt or something to that effect, and by the two acres given to the church, then you were able to purchase the other four. As collateral, you had those two acres that you owned. And I wasn't here at that time, but just amazing what God did to put that on his heart. Not only that, he sold the property we have here for average about 80000 an acre, which was quite a bit cheaper compared to the, just across the road there. And this doesn't have the pipeline running through it. And so just God's goodness and the miracle of God allowing this church even to buy this property. And then, of course, God's allowed us to build this beautiful building and, and uh, see what the Lord's done. But there's thing like that after thing that some I wasn't even here for that I've heard rehearsed again and again, that God has worked in our church. And God's not done with that. He wants to do more. Every generation needs to step out on faith with God and see God work and God become real. And some of us wasn't here for those things in the past, and we've had things in recent years. God wants to continue that way. Our God's a God of greater things. And certainly, leadership has changed. Our world's changed. Many of the people here have changed. But as with families, and your family, as with our nation, the United States of America here, we as a church, we have to choose. How will we respond to the goodness of God? All of us could stand and give personal testimony this morning of God's goodness in our own family, in our own individual life. How will I respond? Psalm 65 here is an amazing psalm. I've been studying it now for several weeks, and it's just been on my heart. Uh, specifically, verse 11 God brought me to this for this day because of this verse. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, <laughs> and thy paths drop fatness. Thou crownest the year as we launch into our 17th year. We're claiming this promise of God. He is so good. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness. Isn't that amazing? Let's read the psalm together. Look at verse 1. The Bible says, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. And unto thee shall the vow be, for, be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed, happy, joy that circumstances cannot take away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are far off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which still at the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness. And thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness. And the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. 
I'm bringing a message entitled this morning, God's goodness and our response. This psalm is a psalm of God's goodness. What's our response? Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd help us as we think of the goodness of God over the 16 years of Gospel at Baptist Church and, and lots of events leading up to even the starting of the church, the vision of Pastor Kilpatrick and all of those things that you did. And Lord, as we think of the goodness to us individually, that you gave your only son to die on Calvary's tree, as we sang, they, here is love this morning. Our hope is that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the goodness, not just of salvation, but of every day of our lives. So many things we couldn't even speak of yesterday, the goodness of God, if we really counted our blessings. It's too many. Lord, we praise you for that. Help us to recognize your goodness. Help us to see our wonderful good God, not just see the complaints that we have. Lord, help us to respond to you and your goodness. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This here is the first, as it sits in the book of Psalms, the first of four Psalms that focus on praising the Lord. Praising the Lord. I don't know about you, but God's word just over and over again as you read through the Psalms just speaks of singing to our God. It commands us to sing it. Praise our God. It's not just talking about at church, although I believe you ought to sing. And the Bible says, what's the hand find to do? Do it with all thy might. You ought to sing with your whole heart. But everywhere, God says, I put a new song in your heart. I mean, God wants us to sing praises unto him with our lips. And, and this is a psalm that focuses on that for his manifold blessings in nature and his gracious dealings with his people. God is good. He's good. He can be nothing else. God is good. That we are to give him glory for his power and his kingdom. Since he pardons us, he pardons sin. He, as you go through the psalm there, you find he satisfies the soul. Uh, he protects his own. He steadies the mountains, it tells us. He calms the sea. He keeps day and night coming. Every morning we wake up rejoicing we have another day. But by the end of the day, we rejoice for night and rest. All of that we rejoice in. God does that. He makes the earth fruitful. And he says we ought to sing about it. We ought to shout for joy for God's goodness. All of this we find in this psalm. I want to see just three truths here. We'll walk through this psalm. A little different style of the message this morning. I hope you'll stay with me. We're just going to walk through the psalm phrase by phrase and make some comments. And I hope it will be so helpful to you that you would know Psalm 65 in a way you've not known before. It's been such an encouragement to me. Number one, we'll see in verse 1 through 4, He is the Savior of sinners. Hallelujah for that. He is the Savior for sinners. You see the way of approach here to God. And we're going to walk through this here phrase by phrase. Notice the first phrase. Phrase waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. Now Zion with an S here is the same as with a Z. Don't let that throw you off. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. Though Babylon might rejoice in the Antichrist, Zion remains faithful to her king, rejoicing in her king, praising him and him only. She brings perpetual offering of worship. His mercies are too numerous to be forgotten. Precious are God's goodnesses to us. I love how he says, praise waiteth for thee, O God. It's like we may praise others, we may say, the praise of someone else, they sang of David's praises. He killed his 10,000, saw his thousands. But we save our best praise for God. Praise waiteth for thee. It also gives an indication of a silence here in praise. Uh, Greg and I were talking about this this, uh, this morning, about praying without ceasing. It doesn't mean you talk all the time in prayer. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter opened his mouth when he shouldn't have, and the God of of heaven spoke from the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. <laughs> it doesn't mean we're talking all the time, but praise waited for thee almost gives the idea of a silence before we praise him. Recognize that even in the greatest praise of our God, we cannot do justice to what he is owed. He's so great. You can imagine sitting in 
in the room where the president's meeting with his chief of staff and his, all the, the chiefs of all the military and all of this, and you're maybe one of the people in the outline of the room sitting there. Just to be in the room would be quite something as they make some strategic decision or dealing with some crisis. But if you were to speak in that setting, you'd be very careful, first, if you were to speak, and secondly, what you were going to say, to speak in the presence of all those. Well, how much thousands of times more to speak the praise of God. Praise waiteth for thee. There's a there's an entering in, there's an understanding of who he is. Quite amazing what a God we have. See, to some degree, we recognize that our praise falls so short. It also gives the idea we're engrossed in his praise to such effect that we're dumb. We don't speak except praises for him. We have no tongue for praise except for our God. Praise waiteth for thee, O God. And... Unto thee shall the vow be performed. Now here in this psalm, perhaps it was a special vow made during a season of drought or during a time of war. Some political danger here as David is the human penman of this psalm. And, and these psalms were songs that they would sing. This was a, almost a song of harvest that they would sing and uh, of God's goodness. And he says, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. Nations and churches have to be honest and prompt in responding, redeeming their promises to the Lord. And as individuals, we should not forget vows and promises. The Bible says we are better ought not to vow than to vow and not pay. Whatever it was that we said we would do, whether service to God or a donation or a praise, whatever it is, it's not a light thing with God to open our mouth and tell them we'll do something. We should fulfill it to the utmost of our power. And unto God alone it should be performed. Not looking to be accepted by others, but single eye, an acceptance of God is all we desire in that performance. As believers, we've all entered into a covenant with God. We're reminded of this when we hear the good old story again of Jesus and how he redeemed us on the cross of Calvary. He was buried and rose again. We entered a covenant, a conversion. We have made that covenant public at baptism. Uh, every time we come to the Lord's table, remember, we are reminded of the covenant we've entered into in salvation. When we join a church, we're reminded again of this wonderful family of God that we have. We're a part of his family. I love to think that God can never leave me, but I'm reminded in that that I can never leave him. I've entered a covenant with him. And it's just like I could never, he could never stop being my father, I could never quit being his son. We're in relationship with him. What a God we have. We've entered some covenant, a vow. We ought to be very deliberate and promising, and very punctual in performing. Verse 2, O thou that hearest prayer. I love this title. This is the title of God. This is thy name, Lord, he's saying. This is your nature. This is your glory. You are the one that hearest prayer. That's what he's saying. O thou that hearest prayer. God has not only one time heard prayer, and we think of the 16 years of gospel light, and even before it began the first day, much prayer and months of preparation and inviting and, and working. But God is now at this moment hearing prayer. And God forever shall hear prayer because he's immutable. He's the unchanging God that is the same yesterday and day, today and forever. And so he says, O oh, thou that hearest prayer. What a delightful title. For our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every right and sincere prayer that's ever been offered has been heard. He's the God that hears prayer. I love here that the psalmist is personal. You notice he uses the word thou, and thee, and thy. Over and over in this psalm here, this hymn, if you will. David evidently believed in a personal God. It wasn't just some abstract idea of some force out there. This was someone that was very personal. He knew his God. He loved God. Then the Bible says, unto thee shall all flesh come. Boy, that's an encouragement that men of all nations ought to pray. 
They all need to come to him. The one and only God who proves that he's God by answering prayer. Those that seek his face, he says, I'll be found of them. <laughs> we're flesh, we're frail, we're weak. But God says, come to him. All flesh, unto thee shall all flesh come. See, thou art such a God as they need. Thou art a God that is a God of compassion, David recognized. He was a God that would condescend to hear the poor cries of flesh and blood though he's the great almighty God. What a God. Many come to thee now in humble faith and are filled with good, but more shall be drawn to thee by thy attractiveness of thy love. In time, we know from the word of God, all earth will bow at his feet. Verse 3, the Bible says, Iniquities prevail against me. Others may accuse us of sin, maybe truthfully. Others it could be slander. But we know our own sins even rise up against us in our own hearts. He says, iniquities prevail against me. See, but for grace, our sins would prevail against us. But for God's grace. But for God's grace, we would be forever in hell as a result of our sins. Think of our good God Iniquities prevail against me, he says, but then he says, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. <laughs> Lord, you cover them all. You have been our propitiation. You're our mercy seat. See, salvation, Jesus died for us. Thou purgest them away. There's nothing you can do, friend, if you're lost here today and you're not saved, and those of you that have been saved, there was nothing we could do to get the sin out. Nothing. It condemned us. All the while, our iniquities, it says here, prevail again. They were prevailing. And sin, when it is finished, the Bible says, bringeth forth death. And that's what all of us had ha should have had. But there is one person that has the water of life, as Miss Jenny sang about that we can come to the well and we can finally have our thirst satisfied. And I'm telling you, friend, we're all sinners, every one of us, starting here, everybody. But Jesus paid it all, and he would save your soul if you'd come to him. He's the only one that can. I can't help you with your sins. I can just point you to the one that can. But if you'll come to him, he'll save you today. That's the type of savior we have. Oh, I love it. He says, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. I love the personal and then the opening here. Notice verse 3, he says, iniquities prevail against me. David's saying, against me. And then he says, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. David says, I know you saved me. I know it's not just for me, though. You will help all of us. Our transgressions. Our God's a God that saves everyone that comes to him. He is so persuaded of the largeness of the forgiving love of God. He says, all saints, sing of his blessings, tell others he'll save them too. What a comfort that iniquities that prevail against us don't prevail against our God. He is greater. They would keep us away from God, but he is able to sweep them away from us. They're too strong for us, but not for our Redeemer. He's mighty. He's almighty to save. It's worth noting that as a priest would go to the laver first and wash before they came into God's presence for sacrifice, David here is leading us to purification from sin before we enter the service of song and praising our God. Once we've washed our robes and made them white by the blood, now we can accept, acceptably praise Him and sing, worthy is the lamb that was slain, who's cleansed us. Verse 4, notice he says, blessed. And we've been studying the Beatitudes. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee. See, after cleansing comes praise, comes joy, comes happiness. First, we're chosen of God. Isn't that amazing? John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That means every person anywhere on this globe at any generation, 
God died for you. I believe when he had his arms spread on Calvary, he was paying the sin debt. As the Bible said, he tasted death for every man. And he died for you. He chose you on Calvary. He didn't have to. But he did. He loved us. That's what Calvary spoke. See, that alone is blessedness. But then, we wouldn't come to God on our own. And God, in His gracious goodness, has wooed us. If you know the Lord is your Savior, you know it wasn't your goodness. It was His goodness that was drawing you with cords of love, the Bible says. People that God brought in your life, Spurgeon would say, the hound of heaven was after me. God was seeking us. We thought we were seeking God, but really God was seeking us. The woman at the well, she said, was seeking, but Jesus first said he must needs go through Samaria. He was seeking her. The Father would say, the, the Spirit seeketh such to worship him. On and on we find God is after us. This too is no slight blessedness. <laughs> Blessed is that man. Further than that, we find because of his drawing, we are made near by the blood of Christ. And by his spirit, we are brought into this intimate fellowship with God. February 8th, 1992 was the day I got saved. It's an eight-year-old boy. That was a great day. It's been a long time now, 27 years ago almost. But to think that our Lord has not just been good to me back then, Every moment he's good to us. His spirit is giving us intimate fellowship every day. See, God's goodness to us abounds. That we have the privilege to talk to him. Sometimes we think, I've got to pray today. I'm supposed to read my Bible and pray. But it should be the other way around that we think about it. To even have the privilege to come into his presence, have access, is unbelievable. Our daughters have gotten enamored with writing the president. They've written, I don't know, several letters. Kristen just finished one yesterday to President Trump. And they draw stuff, and, and it's kind of funny. I don't know why. Chloe's gotten two letters back. Kristen hadn't got one, and she's, she's going to keep writing until she gets one back, you know. But to think if you called and President, whoever it was, but in this case Trump, answered the phone and would speak to you, you'd be like, what? He, he talked to you? You talked to him? Right? We would be amazed at the access, right? But think of our God. The access we've been given at any moment, any second, no matter where you are, you could be in his throne room right at this moment speaking to him. Isn't that amazing? God's goodness to us. Blessed is that man, notice he says, and causes to approach you. This is blessedness, unrivaled blessedness. And to crown all that, we approach as chosen, accepted, to become dwellers in his divine household. This is just heaped upon blessedness, isn't it? And we're not going to just dwell for a while. He says you're going to be treated as sons. The servant may only last a while, but the son, he stays. What blessedness the Father hath bestowed upon us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, that we can dwell in his house. We don't have to go out anymore. Blessed. Permanence. Acceptance. God calls us today. We're all, as believers, as you keep reading there, he says that he may dwell in the courts. We should be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. See, God wants us to enjoy him. God wants us to be satisfied with his goodness. God doesn't want you to go in and out. He wants you to dwell there. He wants you to be seated there. And in First Peter, the Bible says that we are all called now a kingdom of priests. In the Old Testament, they understood only the priests had access into the holy place at all, into the holy of holies only once a year, the high priest. But now we are a kingdom of priests. We are all, we believe as Baptists, in the priesthood of every believer. You don't have to come to me to confess your sin. You don't call me father or whatever. I'm a pastor. I'm going to be a shepherd, a minister. But God says you can come directly through that one mediator of Jesus Christ. Think of the goodness, just heaped upon goodness. We find our complete satisfaction in him. Everything the Old Testament temple pointed to, we have in Jesus Christ. Praise his name. Number two, not only is he the savior, he is the ruler of all nations. 
See, the Lord answers prayer. Not only is he the God that hears prayer, he answers it. In performing wonders for which he's praised, look at verse 5, by terrible things in righteousness will thou answer us, O God of our salvation. Will you notice that phrase in verse 5? Wilt thou answer us? He says his name, O thou that hears prayer, verse 2. Here he says in verse 5, he answers us. You can write a lot of letters, but you may not get one back from the president. <laughs> but God answers prayer. <laughs> now, he says the word terrible here it has the idea of awe, amazed, and wonder. See, because our God is so higher, much higher than us, and his presence, we're all falling out on our face before him. His presence, his awe strikes us. But God's goodness here is that he hears prayer. His glory is that he answers prayer. It's a matter of fitted to inspire awe in the hearts of his people. The saints in the beginning of the psalm offered praise and reverential silence, and now in like awe-stricken spirit, they receive answers to their prayer. Look, we don't always know even what we're asking for when we pray. The disciples would say, Lord, increase our faith. You ever wonder if that's why they ended up on the boat? in the storm sometimes we don't know what we're really asking God doesn't wave a wand and poof we have more faith faith is exercised and built by having to exercise faith see <laughs> the answer comes we may be terrified by it whatever the storm might be you say I want to be more like you I want sanctification and you know what comes the trial because in the fire, the gold is refined, is made more pure. What, what we ask for faith and the more affliction as a result, we pray, Lord, we want to see the gospel spread and God might send persecution to scatter us, as he did in the book of Acts. See, we always don't even know what we're asking, but God knows how to answer. But it's good to ask on, for nothing in God's love that he grants is bad for us. It may not be comfortable, but it's good for us. We'll be glad in it. It's his goodness. We're, as he said, satisfied with the goodness of thy house in verse 4. Then he says in verse 5, Who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea? I love this. He says it's not just the dwellers in Zion that enjoy him. God is the confidence of everybody anywhere on land or on sea. He is the one that we have confidence in. By the way, all of us are equally dependent upon our God. Some sailor on the sea might recognize that more readily as the sea is so huge in the ocean and to think, you know, you can't control what's going to happen. But the farmer in reality is just as dependent. God would send the rain. and The soil nutrition would cause the crops to grow. And no matter what line of work we're in, we are dependent on him. See, he's saying there's no room for self-confidence on land and sea. God is the only one we can be confident in, in him, in him, no matter where. Faith is a plant of universal growth. It's a tree of life on shore and a plant of renown at sea. And blessed be God, those who exercise faith in him anywhere shall find that he is swift and strong to answer their prayers. A remembrance of this should quicken our devotion when we approach unto the Lord our God. Spurgeon's quote. Verse 6, the Bible says, Which by his strength set us fast the mountains, being girded with power. It's as if God, like a light bulb, has fixed the mountains into their socket. That's how great our God is. He has fixed them. His strength setteth fast the mountains. He's preserved them from falling from a storm or an earthquake. So the firmest of us, the strongest of us, owe our stability to God. He's the one that has strength. God's hand set the Alps and the Andes on their bases. Therefore, we should sing his praise. He says being girded with power. Uh, we think of a belt, maybe you think of a belt when you think of girded. It's like the Lord saying, I've cast a girdle of strength around the hills. You can almost see the psalmist sitting here in this mountain, picturesque, 
seeing God's glory and you see strength all around as you see these mountains and see how small we are. Some Grand Canyon. So let us learn as poor puny ones, we've got to go to the strong, capital S, strong for strength. Without him, the everlasting hills would crumble. How much more are our plans, our projects, our labor would come to nothing. Oh, believer, consider the mountains. They find their bases in the undiminished might of God. Where should we find our strength? Verse 7, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, the tumult of the people. His soft breath can smooth the sea, make it like glass. God does this. The noise of their waves, the tumult of the people, as an idea of this ocean of waves, is an idea of, of people in unrest even here. Nations are as difficult to rule as the sea itself, and God controls both. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And God alone is the king of nations. The sea obeys him, but so does the multitude. They're kept in check. Human society owes its preservation to God. What has kept the Nazis from overcoming? What has kept communism from overcoming? Our God's hand has allowed civilization to continue. We can see example after example in history of God's goodness that has allowed us. He's prevented things. He's, he's time and again, kept us by his hand. See, that those that know him ought to fly to God in time of trouble and say, Lord, nothing's too hard for you. I mean, our little problems, he controls everything in the world, land and sea. Verse 8, they also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid of thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoing of the morning and the evening to rejoice. Oh, you think, what are the tokens? He's talking about just the proofs, the phenomena in nature. Even the most barbarian of people see earthquakes, volcanoes erupt. See hurricanes and know they're fearful. Now they fear in a different way. He says, they're afraid at thy tokens. We fear God in a reverential fear. We trust him as Job says, Lord, though thou slay me, yet I'll trust you. But all people see the works of God. It goes throughout the whole world. Hey, word got out about Sodom and Gomorrah. When God rained down fire from heaven. The word got out when Pharaoh and his armies got swallowed by the Red Sea. I mean, word got out of God's tokens, his proofs of his power. That's what he's talking about. He says, they also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. But God is able. Then he says, thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. The east and west are made happy by God's favor, like I mentioned earlier, when the sun comes up and the sun goes down. Our rising hours are bright with hope and our evening moments, we thank the Lord for his goodness. When the sun goes up or down, the gates of the day, up or down, we ought to rejoice in him. Day and night, God's creation witnesses to the nations. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. This is a great missionary text here that no matter the nation of the earth, they need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. How else could they sing the songs of joy to the Lord? How could they sing to him except they know him? How should they believe on them who they have not heard? How should they hear, the Bible says, without a preacher, a proclaimer? It doesn't mean someone like me necessarily. It just means a person to tell them of the great, the great God, our Savior. Then thirdly, lastly, he is the provider of all we need. Verses 9 to 13. It's like a harvest song here. He says, thou visitest the earth and waterest it. When God visits, he leaves blessings behind. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Uh, some people, they visit and they take, right? <laughs> you have family like that? But when God visits, he gives. He always leaves blessings behind. The Bible says he waters the earth. He, he's almost showing himself as a gardener here. He's surveying his garden and giving water to every plant that requires it. Not in small quantities, but as much as is needed, abundant. See? And I pray, Lord, in this manner, water me. Water this church. Lord, may you give us no plant in thy garden needs it more than me. I don't know if you've 
watered something for very long, maybe your grass or something, but it can get expensive. You understand that millions of dollars could not provide what God provides in watering the earth. Some of you farmers, you know, I mean, you know, you look for the rain. You maybe even have a pond and some place to pump water out of to store the water if the rain doesn't come. Think of that. Have you ever thought of it? The soil is made rich by the rain. Look what he says there in verse 9. Thou visit the earth and waters it. Thou greatly enriches it, enriches it with the river of God, which is full of water. <laughs> I mean, it can pour rain. And it's supposed to rain later today. And tomorrow, it can do the same thing. God doesn't run out of water. Isn't that amazing? He says it's, it's full. There's no bottom. There's no shore to God's river. And not at all. How true it is in the realm of grace. There the river of God is full. Where sin abounded, grace yet did much more abound. Is fullness. We've all received, the Bible says, grace for grace, haven't we? Then he says, thou preparest them corn. You think, boy, I'm getting hungry. Amen. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. <laughs> See, as surely as the manna that fell from heaven for the tribes of Israel, the children of Israel, God gives us food <laughs> every day. Now look, if we walked out the door here today and there was man all over the ground, we'd be shouting. I mean, we, people think we're Pentecostal all of a sudden, right? And I'm, I'm okay with shout. He said to shout right here. He, he said, the manna, what a miracle. You know what? It's no less a miracle if it came down from heaven as it comes up from the earth, wheat that grows or corn or whatever you plant. I mean, I don't care what you do. You can try all you want to make something grow. Unless God grows it, it doesn't happen. I mean, it's a miracle. I mean, just like every baby that's born, that's a miracle. Every corn or any flower that grows out of the ground, that's a miracle. That God gives the nutrients and the sunlight and the rain, all of that is of God. And God's saying, I'm the giver. I'm my goodness. Can't you see my goodness? Look at what he does. It rises out of the dust. That's just much a miracle as if it fell from the sky. He's the great householder that's providing for all of us. Just like that, he gives heavenly food for his redeemed ones. He hath given meat unto them that fear him, the Bible says. He's ever mindful of his covenant. Then verse 10, thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. I like that word. God said, I didn't come that you might have life only, but that you have, might have it more abundantly, right? Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Here you can see the a freshly plowed field, right? And I know we don't have, maybe have as much of that around here, but you get in the flatter areas of Alabama or in other states, and there's the plowed fields you could drive for hours in, in different of the flatter states. Oklahoma was that way, and just field after field. Canada, Saskatchewan, Manitoba was that way. And, and you can see the furrows here of a field. Someone's freshly plowed a field, and the, he says the showers are able to fill that. Plenty of rain. God does that. The drought will turn clods into like stones. I remember throwing big chunks of dirt as a kid and not knowing if it was a rock or not until you hit it on something hard enough because it was so dry and the ground crack open and stuff. You ever seen something so dry? But the rain of God can soften it. That's what he's saying. As God gives rain, he softens. He softens. Loosens the soil that was made into like iron. Thou blessest the springing thereof, he says in verse 10. The springing, that's all God. Stuff comes up out of the ground, that's God. God, by his water, vegetation is awakened by the moisture and leaps into vigor and all of a sudden germinates and things grow and the green shoot comes out. And you, If you've been around plants, that sorry, there's a smell and you can, that's God doing all that, his blessing. All this may furnish us with a figure of the operations of the Holy Spirit. He beats down thoughts that need to, high thoughts that rise up against God. He fills our lowly desires, softening the soul, causing every holy thing to increase and spread. See, our God causeth. Everything begins with God. Our God creates. He created. Our God crowneth. That's where we get to verse 11 here. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. We start on the 17th year of our church. We're claiming God's promise. You crown the year with your goodness, the, the harvest is the plainest display of the, the divine bounty, the crown of the year, and the Lord himself does that. 
Uh, this expression you could take this way, God encircles the year with his goodness, like a crown. He encircles every month another gem in the crown. Each day is a pearl of God's goodness. My paths drop fatness. It's like the foot, footsteps of God leave fertilizer behind and cause growth. You can see the application in the Christian. We're not just talking about a field, right? God's paths. As you follow him, he gives light, doesn't he? For spiritual harvest, we must look to him, for he alone can give times of refreshing. He alone sends revival. His paths drop fatness. Verse 12, they drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. God doesn't just send rain where all the people are. Out in the wilderness where it's just animals, God still sends rain. The deer drink out of the puddles that God sent. The, the, the birds drink out of the same. Every soul under heaven, no matter how far away from civilization, God sends rain. He visits those people with love. In the little hills, he says, rejoice on every side. There's no little people with God. With God, we're all important. He loves all of us. He died for all of us. All creation rejoices in his goodness. What a savior. The last verse, the pastures are clothed with flocks. Think of sheep and think of the wool and the clothing that we wear, but first the pastures wear them <laughs> with the sheep. Clothe, clothe of a man, first it clothes the field. Interesting the term there, are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. Our food is grazing flocks or crops waving in the, in the air. Both are gifts from God. God allows Praise should be rendered. Then he says, they shout for joy. There ought to be a vocal response of praise from each of us. He says, they shout for joy. They render praise. There's a joyous shout. By the way, the animals, there's a sound and a song. The Bible teaches that of the animals and the, and the, and the wind and the different things you can hear. God's praise is being sung. We ought to recognize that and join in the song of praising our great creator. If you read the Psalms, you're convinced. There's no way you can't be. We should take every opportunity to sing unto our God. Praise him. If you're paying attention, if you read the Psalms, you can't miss it. May God help us. All is for the Lord. The world is like a hymn to the eternal as far as what he created, his creation. And blessed is each of us that join in that and want to praise him for his goodness. Look at him. Look at his greatness. Look in your own life at his generosity. Look at his goodness. There's no doubt the emphasis here is on God's goodness, God's generosity to his people. You can't read these verses without expressing appreciation. If you read these verses, you express adoration for our God. But you think about individually, certainly we could all talk about individually, but as a church collectively. I mean, look around right here. Look at, look at the people that God has put together. Right here. Look at the place God's allowed us to have. Now we are stewards of these precious gifts. What will be our response? As we conclude, some people look at life and they're defined by what's happened to them. All of their life they go through this idea of, well, so-and-so did this to me or my parents or uh, this uh, disease or this sickness, this cause or this, and they're defined by something that happened to them. But our God's goodness, the truth is if you look hard enough, you can see his goodness in everything. To be honest with you, in just my short 14 years in ministry, there are things that have happened in my ministry that other men have quit the ministry over. Not because I did it. I'm saying they'd happen the exact same thing, similar situation, and they quit the ministry. I'm not trying to lift myself up. I'm just saying if you want to look for something, you can find something bad and excuse your sin or what you do in your life is because of this that happened to me, or what someone did. But the reverse is true. We sing the song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. If you will look, if you'll stop and see what God has done, 
There is goodness upon goodness upon goodness. That's what this psalm is all about. God's great goodness to us. His great goodness to you specifically. Count your blessings. There is so much to praise God over. I want to focus and let God overcome the hurt, don't you? I want to let God fo focus on God and let Him overcome the problems. Because He's greater. He's greater than the greatest problem you think you have. The truth is, life is short. There's no time to waste. I want to give God everything. That's my response. I want to leave nothing on the table. I don't want to leave anything on the field, so to speak. I'm determined to give God the best years of my life. I'm entering the best years of strength. I'm at the beginning of the best years of my ministry. In the next 25 years, for my generation, it's my generation's turn to bear the load for Christ, to serve Him with our strength and further the cause of Christ. And I want you to know, we see God's goodness What's our response? I've chosen my response. I want to set the sails for the wind. I want to prepare the ground for the rain. And pray and expect God's blessing. Looking, pleading for revival. God would send it again. I'm committed to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No turning back. No compromise, no complaint, no complacency. I want to go on for Jesus with all my heart, fully committed to Him. And I came this morning, wanted to ask you that called Gospel Light Baptist Church your church home. What's your response to God's goodness? He's been good to us. None of us could question that. None of us could doubt that. I wonder... Would you choose the Lord's way with me? A choice has to be made. How will I respond to all that God's given to us? What should we render for His benefits to us? Some of you have seen our new um, offering envelopes. It says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits toward me? Psalm 116, 12. God's goodness is plain and obvious. How will I respond? In 1555, it's part of... Bloody Mary's campaign to reestablish the Catholic Church in England, she got one of the most prominent Protestant ministers of the day, John Philpot. She led him to be burnt at the stake. When they went to get him, he didn't fight and resist like many would and you know, scratch and claw and you know. Instead, he came willingly. <laughs> he said, I am ready. God, grant me strength and a joyful resurrection. Phil Paul walked to the place of his execution. He knelt down when he got to the stake and kissed it. He gave his life for Christ. He was committed. What a response. See, it's easy for us to focus on our problems and think they're larger than they really are. Most of us never endured genuine persecution for our faith. I mean, a few times people have gotten upset with me or maybe you for sharing the gospel. Or, but none of them tried to kill me. So there may come a day when we face a life or death decision to be loyal to Christ. Regardless of the consequences, though, in lesser trials yet, there's still a definite choice to make. God has been good to me. How will I respond? Will I stand firm on what is right? Or will I lower the standard to avoid trouble? What's it going to be for you? How will you respond?